So that's John Bayavel. He's a perfumer and creator at January Scent Project. He, rece he received his BFA from the Copper Union in New York City, where he started painting and photography. He currently splits his time between user experience design for education software, writing for Fragantica, painting and making perfume. John is gonna talk about developing smell through verbalization. Hello everyone. Um, as you just mentioned, I'm John Beeble. Nice to meet you all. Um, I'm going to present quite a lot of info, so I'll uh, go not too quickly, but hopefully we'll get through it all. Um, as you uh, just heard, I do some writing for Fragrantica. I perfume for January Scent Project. I also work as a uh, UX designer uh, for Pearson Education. Um, one of the things I wanted to do before we begin our discussion about verbalization and smelling and scent is to start us off with uh, a few quotes that will sort of set the stage or add some context for us. Um, one person that I think is important to uh, think about in terms of the connections of language and thought and how it affects how we verbalize things is uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, um, you know, very famous philosopher and logician. Um, two things I like that he has said about that connection is the aspect of things that are most familiar to us are hidden because of their familiarity and their simplicity. And the limits of your language are the limits of your world. I was once able to interview Mandy Aftel, who many of you know from her writing and her perfumes. And in an interview I did with her in March of 2019, she said, someone came in, in this case, to the uh, Archive of Curious Scents that she has yesterday and said, I really love this stuff, but I don't think I have a good sense of smell. I wrote about this in my book, Fragrant. And I said to him, everywhere you go, start shopping with your nose, start ripping up leaves, start smelling the end of a piece of fruit, everything. Start putting your own words to that and it'll start getting better. You just need to bring your consciousness to it and it will improve. The last quote I'd like to read from to give us some context here is a quote from the Belvoir Media Group and this was through MGH, Massachusetts General Hospital about the synapses in the brain and how we learn. <clears throat> it's generally agreed that learning occurs when the acquisition of new information causes synaptic changes, but scientists are not yet certain precisely how these changes come about. There are several theories, one of which is the Hebbian theory. And it's thought that any two cells or system of cells that are repeatedly activated at the same time will tend to become associated so that the activity in one makes it likely that the other will become active. So these repeated co-activation of connected cells is thought to make physical changes in the brain, such as the development of new synapses between neurons or more receptors in the postsynaptic memory leading to lasting memory. Another theory ascribes learning to the strengthening of existing synapses. It is thought that the developing brain overproduces synapses in early life, subsequently experienced by activating certain nerve cells repeatedly and ignoring others determines which synapses become mature and stable in which ones wither away in a process of synaptic pruning. So the essence of that is that by you know, continually um, exercising the same thoughts over and over again, we are strengthening those but letting the others die off, which has a lot to do with how we verbalize and what we continue to think over and over again and not expand the ability of our language. So I'd like to move right into more or less an exercise about smell and how it informs um, the way that we talk about it. And this is an exercise that I went through and it has to do with smelling ylang lang, which is a flower. And I wanna add a bit of context here in that when I began making perfumes, this is um, something that I did, I hadn't smelled very much at all. It's, it's something I'm just not very familiar with. So I had very little innate vocabulary to talk about this flower. I just knew that it came from a flower. Um, so my words for it were, were extraordinarily limited. The, the most I could do initially was to talk about, you know, other flowers. So I talked about in my head and verbally, I still spoke about gardenia and jasmine. And the most I could do next was to think of things such as, it's a heady flower, an exotic flower. 
and that's about it. But I was still speaking in the language of flowers. I, I couldn't really get out of that language. So I realized that there were some gaps there in this process. Um, and part of those had to do with existing tropes, if you will, within language. So there are written descriptions of what I have smelled. So I could go anywhere online or read in books to say, Yilang Lang smells like, and they would list some things. And then there was the thing in front of me that I was smelling. And then there's what I like to kind of comically think of, what an intelligent speaker would say that I'm smelling. And this would be sort of a learned person who would say, well, you know, the typical Ylang Lang quality is dot, dot, dot. And it sort of becomes another trope of what, you know, we're supposed to think Ylang Lang smells like. Um, so these are some of the assumptions I think we bring to smell when we ever smell anything, whether it's something we've smelled a million times or it's the first time, is what we think we should be smelling or expect to smell, what we're told to smell, what it doesn't smell like or shouldn't smell like, um, what will people of my culture think this smells, and is it the same as people of another culture, and will they speak about it in the same way? And this gets into cross-cultural semantics where we may agree on certain things in different cultures, but they really may have very different descriptors, adjectives, words. They might play a very different part in our daily lives. So to better understand smell and expand our knowledge and appreciation of it through verbalization, I think we have to shift and think more about expansion. So some of the verbs that I think about in a context like this are things like to write and speak and say, those are our kind of action verbs, with goals toward extending, expanding, enlarging, and also to inform. And it can either be to inform ourselves or to inform others by, um, through our verbalization process. So to get back to Ylang Lang, smelling and speaking. So how do we start? Well, I started to smell it. I just started to really smell it and, and forget anything that I'd read about it and started to write. And this was my way of verbalizing and even talking out loud in the process. So what was I smelling? Well, I started to write these things down. I smelled vapor, an exotic flower, tanning lotion, betel nut, cream, nutmeg and mace, cinnamon, tar, soap, asphalt, rubber, sandalwood, milk, and a kind of haze. That was what I consider sort of my first level reactive verbalizations of smell. And then I kind of stepped back a bit and said, all right, well, if I go deeper and deeper into the smell, what am I really smelling? There was something very humid in there. Um, the smell of something mucilaginous like okra, okra pods, neroli, this sort of solar sensation or sunlight on, on the ground or on dirt, vinyl, cooking oil, chewing gum, banana, banana skins, plantains, butter, coconut oil, safflower oil, narcissus, clay, a blonde wood, like a blonde mahogany, a kind of cheap or inexpensive gardenia perfume oil is sort of something I smelled there, a very thin cream or sort of fatty milk, vanilla, and just a little bit of hazelnuts. So what I was essentially doing through that exercise there was, you know, smelling very deeply, verbalizing what I was smelling, and then from that, I'm able to create my own sort of expanded verbalized description of Ylang Lang that um, hitherto I hadn't been able to do um, by really pushing my brain and pushing my experience as far as possible. So I ended up being able to say Ylang Lang is a humid tropical flower with a hazy unfocused scent of island blossoms mixed with milk, cinnamon, rubber, sandalwood, vanilla, and banana skins. Smelling deeper, unusual notes appear, such as the fragrance of okra pods, vinyl, chewing gum, cooking oil, hazelnuts, butter, clay, and nutmeg. Although it has some signature facets of smells we might attribute to equatorial, it is also somewhat removed from the natural olfactive palate and is slightly alien, perhaps because it isn't as beautiful as we expect flowers to be. It has a dirtiness and tar-like quality that is curious but attractive, adding a level of pleasant oddness to this flower's complexity. So part of that process when I, I thought about it later involved a lot of sort of uninhibited thinking and uninhibited smelling and I noticed that they were equal processes for me and 
I believe it's something that a lot of perfumers or writers um, go through when they need to expand the vocabulary that they use in order to understand smell. And in this process over the years, as I've as I've been doing this sort of expanded thinking, I've found that there are qualities that I distinctly associate with smells now that I just didn't before. And I think that it's not a matter of trying to find something that isn't there. It actually is a matter of finding something that is there. And in the process, some that I, I've noticed have been uh, sort of perennial, uh, interesting associations that I've made, for example, are the smell of pulp that I get in violets that geranium always has a smell of dirt involved to me or can often have that smell of dirt. That basil, especially in a full concentration, smells a lot like chocolate. Um, magnolia uh, resembles black pepper. Oak smells a lot like pure vodka or just a little bit of a rummy vodka. Um, rose can have a quality that's very much like grape jelly. Iris has that very dry, very, very dry dust. Oak moss is one of the most complex smells I've ever encountered. And I'm always finding that adjectives come to me more and more, but the ones I consistently find are olives and molasses, always. Um, orris smells a lot like cooked pumpkin, sandalwood a lot like whole milk, um, jasmine a bit like a wilting or rotting cabbage to me, <laughs> and pink pepper always smells like salted meat. This is something quite, quite true for me. Um, so this process, though, is really, to me, is a matter of putting words to what we think. And that is really a process of verbalization. Another interesting example of where this comes into play, I think, is where we sometimes have a lack of words. And I think of that often with the, um, uh, in the case of the smell of cloves. And um, basically, this is an example of where our word associations can either be very restrictive or very liberating. And the clove example is one that's been extremely restrictive. And I, I kind of have to laugh, and I've referred to this with some friends as the sort of clove conundrum, where there's been such an association, this one synapse that we keep overworking, where we think of cloves and carnations being so tied together that even just going to Wikipedia um, and, and looking at some descriptions, the word clove is repeated in all the descriptions of um, dianthus or, or carnations, you know, obviously in the clove itself or in the descriptions of basil. So under uh, the description for carnation, dianthus uh, carophyllus, commonly known as carnation or clove pink is a species of dianthus, which has clove involved in that name for clove pink, eugenol oil, Sorry, eugenol composes uh, 72 to 90 percent of the essential oil extracted from cloves, which gives its aroma. And various basils have different scents because of the different essential oils, um, but they contain linalool, methyl chavicol, or estragol, other constituents, including eugenol, uh, myrcene. The clove scent of sweet basil is derived from eugenol. So again. So it leaves us in this funny case where you'll read things like the clove smell of carnations, the clove-like smell of basil, which then makes me wonder, well, what, what adjectives does that leave us to describe cloves? It doesn't really leave us with very much, does it? Um, and I feel like that conundrum hasn't been quite solved yet. I, I, challenge, I challenge all of you to, to, to solve that one for us. But it did bring me back to this notion of the carnation and one of the perfumes that many people associate as kind of that pure um, carnation smell is um, Krasnya Moskva, um, which is the um, it's a very classic carnation perfume, uh, Russian carnation perfume that um, has a lot of characteristics. And I, I, I took out a bottle that I have and I thought, well, goodness, this is that sort of, you know, um, the moment where one would smell a carnation and would you, you know, just refer to it as cloves? Can I get past the clove language barrier, you know, and push my brain beyond that? So again, I did the same exercise I did with Elang Lang and I thought, what am I actually smelling? And these were the things I was able to pull from it. Sweet, floral, spicy, cool, mentholic, bright, aromatic, fresh green, refrigerated, chilled, rosy, acidic, wine-like, vanilla, honey, ambery, iris root, carrots, green vegetables, pepper, exotic flowers, slight touch of indole, lily of the valley, tonka beans, coumarin, tiny edge of smoke, plastic quality, bracing, nostalgic, energetic. So how 
do we verbalize most effectively to enlarge our senses? What I did through these experiments is to come up with a list essentially of methods that essentially help to allow the brain to expand its ways of thinking through some practical methods. And these are the ways based on the things that we have looked at previously. One needs to get words out of your head and into writing and speech. And I think that's essential here um, because um, I, I find in, in my experience in speaking to other writers, other thinkers, other artists, that often those ideas that remain in the head never sort of get become voiced and therefore they can get often get lost in that process. So the verbalization process um, not only puts it out of your head for examination, but it becomes historical in that sense for reference. Describe the things that you smell in this very relentless way. Um, and that's really to sort of attack smells as, as um, uh, objects to be understood, um, to do it very relentlessly. Creative inhibition which we can all experience, can really limit our capacity to experience. So you need to remove mental barriers toward um, expression. And I think that people who love to smell things will often think that they don't have a lot of barriers, but I, I've even encountered that I still to this day will find that I have some intrinsic barriers to the way that I experience from smells and I, I'm actively removing those um, from the way that I think. To think of words spatially is one important way, and those closest to a smell are sort of the strongest, and those further away are more nuances, um, which is actually interesting in light of uh, Frederick's presentation that he just did, because AI visualizations tend to be quite similar, where those that cluster together physically um, in a diagram and those that are further apart often will be a, a great visual reference for um, associations that are made. Um, to stretch your vocabulary of smell to include more and more of those nuances, which is essentially what I was doing in the example of Ylang Mai. To allow for unusual associations between smell and the other senses, so things like sound, movement, texture, uh, pictures, and taste. And to a little sort of sub-step of that, to assign smells with sounds or shapes to reimagine their quality. So to sort of be moved beyond just a word and um, a word in a smell and making that connection, but to assign sort of a sort of triangulation of some other um, sensory or um, mode to think about that smell. Um, to smell natural materials and essences to gain an understanding of their complexity, I think is very important here because often uh, components that um, mimic natural things uh, may not have quite as much of the com inherent complexity that, that some natural thing might, so it's good to have those as references. It's important to trust your brain's processes, really, and to give it all of that room it needs in order to express and to do things. And as I mentioned in the beginning, um, to, to keep in mind that the more neural pathways that you do open up when you do express these things verbally, the more you're sort of en enlarging the capacity that you have to smell and experience more things. Now, this is getting into an area that's probably a bit controversial, not, not for me personally, I think, but for anyone. We don't really know exactly the science about whether smell is objective or, or subjective, but I think we could all agree that there's going to be some level of objectivity or subjectivity to smell. And what's good, though, and I think we could probably find peace in the sense that in your learning in brain expansion and verbalization, that you don't have to settle on upon the notion of what is objective or subjective. There's going to be some level of subjectivity there, and that's okay, and you can sort of dive into that. And to think of your increased language as increased visual resolution, you know, that's a good sort of visual modality there, in that the greater linguistic complexity you allow, the greater detail that you're bringing to the process of smelling. Um, and with that, that sort of wraps up. Um, the presentation. I'm proud of myself for getting in uh, 20 minutes. <laughs> and I wanted to leave some room for some questions. Well done on the timing, John. Nicely done. Um, okay, so there's a lot of comments and a couple of people are saying, uh, Susano in, in particular says, um, I, I totally appreciate the cross-cultural acknowledgement. I was just thinking there's probably folks for whom Ylang Ylang may be familiar and comforting rather than exotic. Um, 
Yeah. I, and if I could respond to that too, I think that that's actually what I wanted to sort of acknowledge in that, in that comment is that I almost have to acknowledge a, a bias in that. Like, for example, this whole exercise was interesting for me initially when I first smelled it of, of realizing how um, it was not a common smell for me. And I think one of the great processes of um, going through this and verbalizing is, is it starts to become a more familiar thing to you. So there is less sort of an exoticism uh, attributed to it. Totally. Um, so following up on that, Danielle, uh, hi Danielle, up in San Francisco says, uh, love John's writing and I want to know if he avoids reading descriptors or ingredient lists when he evaluates a fragrance for Fragrantica. Yeah, I appreciate the question, and it's one I've thought a lot about, and I've um, addressed in a, in a writing class that I've done, too. I think um, I don't avoid them. I, I, and I'll tell you, it's been good to start making perfumes because it's enabled me to understand a little bit more about the inexactness, should we, shall we say, of, um, uh, of ingredient lists in that they tend to be a mixture of maybe there is some of that actual ingredient in something and maybe something is a fantasy note or an accord. And what I've found now that I tend to do is to do a uh, kind of an, a, a personal analysis of what I smell. I look at what someone has said that something smells like and together it creates this big picture and I pull a little bit from each thing. And so, it, and I often refer to it as, a, as an informed opinion um, of what's happening within the perfume based on those two factors together. Um, Christophe Le Damiel gives you thumb, thumb, thumbs up. It says nuances and gradations or lack thereof. Like there That's weird. That's weird. Can you hear can me? You hear me? Mm -hmm. I can hear myself. Uh, uh -huh. So he says nuances and gradations or lack thereof are number one oh, issue with commercial scent descriptions. Agreed, totally, yeah. We, we were, in fact, that's part of this exercise is I feel as though we're almost dissuaded from thinking in the nuances of smell. That we're, we're actually trying to be steered toward um, smaller, like thinner language, you know, and, and just reinforcing those synapses already, you know, so it's, so it's less, less creative and less, less descriptive. Agreed. Um, and then Tammy uh, in Australia says she loves hearing what kids say spontaneously when offered something to smell. Uh, Fantastic. Yeah. Um, John, I think everyone's getting an echo. Can you just mute me for a sec? And then unmute me. Because uh, I, I think what's happening is, oh no, it's actually fixed. Because what's happening is I think it's going out to your speakers and then coming back. So we're getting a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a, a, an echo. Uh, but I think that fixed it. So we're good. Um, cool. Any other questions for John? We have a few minutes. Oh yeah, here we go. Uh, Jory has a question. Is there a particular aroma fragrance material that your nose reads as completely different than common descriptors? Uh, what do you do in those situations? Yeah, I would go back to the note about basil. Um, I, I've, it's, it's, a, it's a funny note that I've had a really hard time with and um, I'm just now beginning to, um, how shall I say, um, appreciate what the average person smells basil like because to me it smells like everything it isn't. In fact, someone even looked up some of the chemical constituents of basil and said, John, this makes no sense. None of the things you're saying here smells like basil because to me it smells very much like a um, an unpleasant piece of chocolate. And, and um, you know, someday I may do something with that from a creative perspective, but yeah, and I, I actually delight in moments like that because I think um, it sort of ex shows how expansive our brain can be in the way that we perceive. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Jazz asks, have you thought about the concept of writing for people with anosmia? Uh, and Jazz goes on to say that they know a few people who have been thinking about this lately. It's a really great question. And I have thought of it only, um, it's not something I've thought about doing yet, although I, I think it's a great and noble task and I would probably would love to try to do it at some point. I think the, um, the the it's such an interesting place because um, the the merging of physical sensation um, with approximations of what smell could be is I mean it, it it would be such a fantastic project to do and also to be able to give 
someone to communicate in a way that would effectively give that person a sense of what the translation of smell into a sort of a physical sensation. I mean, it would be a pretty hard task to do, but I, I think it'd be a, a great one, an, an absolutely great one to do, yeah. Yeah, that, that would be challenging, huh? It would um, be. Oh, actually, last quick thing while, while we, uh, yeah, well, we have one time for one more question. Kathleen says, I have found myself fascinated with the fragrance based on a Kelling review. Then I smell the perfume and it is a whole other experience. Curious about that. And then Kathleen says, oops, too late. And I'm saying not at all too late, Kathleen. No, <laughs> it's great. I'm asked this a lot and, and people have asked me sort of like, what is the role of a, of a review? You know, is it, to, um, is it to inform about what a perfume is? Is it to just sort of extrapolate on one's personal thoughts on something? I mean, and, and I think there are very different schools of thought. I would like to see at some point, I think, um, a little bit more uh, maybe thought about what is the role of, of um, reviewing in perfume and to see possibly even a little more um, rigor around that to be helpful to people and maybe even a little bit of academic rigor to it. Having said that, I think that reviews can, a good review can do a little of all of that, that it can inform a user where about what it actually is like, and it can also um, provide some personal context all presented in a way that um, where all those pieces are understood by the user so that you don't get huge surprises. Well, thanks, John. I'm going to put you as, a, as an attendee so you can relax. <laughs> <laughs>